You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Hi, welcome to this live discussion by INCJ, which we're recording as a YouTube and podcast for people who maybe want to catch up later. Hello, my name is John Scott, and I'm hosting this event for the International Network Criminal Justice. If you want to find us, uh, you look on www.criminaljusticenetwork.net, or if you want to follow us, it's on Twitter at INT. CJ Network. Hi, Royal Brick. Uh, today's subject is the hot topic of artificial intelligence and the criminal justice system. It's the first of seven events in our 2022 program, and we've got a panel of experts and a live audience, and we'll be discussing what changes artificial intelligence is bringing and how AI is already impacting criminal justice practice. Uh, in a roundtable conversation, contributions will be made by five experts before our live audience, but, but we'll be inviting you to send in points and questions. And if we can get the system to work okay, I'll invite uh, you to join in the roundtable later in the event to broaden the sense of community. And we, what we're aiming to do is get the feel of a phone-in radio discussion. But let's just see how it goes. So first, let me introduce our roundtable panel members. It comprises uh, Dr. Victoria Knight from De Montfort University in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's an associate professor and has two core areas uh, of research, uh, digital technologies and their use in prisons and uh, looking at emotion and criminal justice. The next person to welcome is Professor Mike Nellis from the University of Strathclyde in Scotland. And he's written really widely on electronic monitoring and has been a Council of Europe expert advisor on this topic. Next, Pia Puolaka, who's from the Smart Prison Project in Finland. And she has a background as a prison psychologist and is currently the project manager for RISE AI project for the Criminal Sanctions Agency. And then Matt Rowland, who is a technology innovation consultant for criminal justice in the United States. And he's a former chief senior executive officer in Washington, D.C. for the probation and pretrial services. And the final member of the panel is Stephen van der Sten from Smart Corrections, Belgium. And he's an expert in digital, digital transformation projects and is a board member of the International Corrections and Prisons Association. Now, we've got lots of space, but that doesn't mean to say that we want huge, long contributions. The aim is that we get snappy, quick points rather than great, long uh, things, paragraphs. And my aim, everybody, is to start things going by asking questions, uh, but if you want to but in, please raise your hand and we'll make sure that everybody gets a fair say. So I thought I'd get the ball rolling by asking each, each of you what your take is on AI or artificial intelligence. And perhaps start by asking what is meant by AI and how is it currently being used in the criminal justice system? So what is meant by AI and how is it currently being used? Should we start? Should we go in alphabetical order to start? And that, uh, and in, in your second name. So let's start with Victoria, shall we? You need to unmute Vic. Uh, I was hoping to be last, John. <laughs> <laughs> we could have, could have your first name, couldn't we? So what, what what's 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 what do we mean by AI? Well, it's machine learning, and and where where we have machines and technology to um, work on behalf of humans um, to um, take data, process it according to a set of algorithms, and help humans to make decisions. Um, very much informed by the work that. Mike, who's here today, and, and, and I've had lots of lengthy conversations with him about that, that, you know, 
when we think about artificial intelligence, particularly in the penal context, and I think this is what's going to be distinctive about this conversation, and I want to labour that point, is that when you, um, I suppose, place certain technologies within the penal context, it has very distinctive impacts. I think as a, as a researcher on digital technologies within this landscape, I worry about the kind of ethical and moral implications of this. And I'll probably say more about that later. But I think, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a basic definition, and I am no expert on artificial intelligence, I haven't done any research. That's my caveat here. <laughs> so I feel a bit of a fraud in this conversation, I must admit. But um, I'm being, I am being encouraged by peers and, and, and practitioners to to think more about that. Um, so I think I would like to kind of throw in some questions for me as, um, you know, how can we ensure that machine le learning, because there is an inevitability of, of, of a, a movement towards this, how can we ensure that, that humans aren't, <clears throat> aren't um, harmed um, as a result of machine intervention? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, Mike, Nellis is next in the alphabetical order. So, what would your definition be? Uh, you need to unmute Mike. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Well, I mean, I think what Victoria said is uh, is fair enough as a as a starting point. Um, the artificial intelligence, and perhaps it's best to put that in, in speech marks that we have at the moment, is in effect machine learning. The creation of vast databases that can be read by algorithms and can in some senses teach themselves how to achieve goals in ways that they were not initially directly programmed to do. And they can do this on a vast scale and at a greater speed than people can do them, right? Yeah. And in that sense, even the forms of artificial intelligence that we have now are better than human because they can do things at scale and at speed that people can't do. It doesn't mean that they're superior to humans in terms of the, if you like, the actual ideas that they can think or come up with, right? But of course, there are AI experts down the line who say that that will come. And the gist of the, the Reef lectures that were done on the BBC in England recently was in part exploring that possibility of much more advanced machines than we're um, operating at the present moment in time. Artificial intelligence as we have it at the moment is not better than human in the sense that it can you know, whatever it can do at scale and at speed, it can only really do one thing at a time, right? So we call what we've got at the moment narrow artificial intelligence. But general artificial intelligence, which has been worked on and hoped for and anticipated, would be able to do variable tasks, either in sequence or simultaneously. And that, it is said, would approximate much more to what human beings are like, because we can think about several things at once. We can multitask. But at the moment, while artificial intelligence can beat the world's greatest chess players, the world's greatest goal players, and can win quiz shows, it can't do two things at once. And that makes it sound like it's not significant. But of course, narrow AI, in terms of the things that it can do and the managerial implications of that, is a big deal. I mean, it's a very significant thing that we are able to do um, these vast analyses of databases at scale and at speed. So that's the definition of it. It, it connects to robotics as well. You can see robotics as a kind of tangent in relation to the broader AI debate. Um, robots are artificial intelligences that are embodied, sometimes mobile and capable of doing physical things, right? In a way that by definition, isn't intrinsic to AI, but if you talk about robotics, you can do those things as well. So I've only really defined AI in what I've said there, 
And I, I think it's coming, right? We, it is coming. It is going to work. And this is a process that we need to understand professionally, sociologically, politically. It's just I'm personally I'm not enthusiastic about embracing it. That, that's really helpful. And by that, I, I like that narrow and general because that's going to help us see it in different stages, isn't it? So thank you very much indeed. Um, Pia, you're um, working on real projects in, in Finland. Uh, would you want to add anything to the, the definitions that have been given by Victoria and Mike? Or uh, the, 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 does that definition help? Um, do you hear me, first of yes, all? Yes, perfectly, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. A lot is uh, said already, but uh, I like the definition that AI is something that uh, simulates human intelligence processes. But as Mike said, at the moment, it can only simulate very basic processes, reasoning processes. So it's at its best, it's able to uh, analyze correlations between different items in the data, identifying patterns, and then applying this knowledge to certain questions or to new data. And yes, we have a project that is actually uh, doing this kind of uh, narrow AI type of uh, work, but it's going to be in our new offender management system. And its purpose is to analyze the background data of offenders. And based on these, it can uh, recommend uh, some activities uh, during your sentence time and, to eff- and, and in this way to effect on the risk of uh, recidivism. So that is what it's uh, supposed to do. And, and you have to re- also remember that uh, humans make AI. So humans are the ones that program and make the algorithms and tell what are the correlations between different items of data. So you, so you need a lot of experts to make a good uh, and accurate AI system. And in my team, I have a very good psychologist and criminologist uh, with me to work with this um, new program. So I hope it will be a good system. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt, um, in, in America, would the definitions that so far have come from a European perspective, would those definitions be ones that you would recognize? I do, and, and I, I think it's fairly consistent. Um, I tease Mike periodically, I'm a little more optimistic. I, I think about the role it could play, because for me, uh, AI is just yet another tool that could be used uh, to achieve the goals of corrections. Um, and like any tool, it could be misused or it could be used effectively. It could you know, be in the hands of somebody who is, is well-meaning, but uh, not, you know, again, technically capable of wielding it correctly. Uh, or on the other hand, it could fall to somebody who is really technically capable, uh, but doesn't have the best of intentions. So I think these conversations that we're having right now are extremely important because as everyone says, it's an evolutionary process. And we need to work out these concepts and these concerns ahead of time. So we shape AI and AI doesn't shape us because I definitely agree with all the other speakers that it seems inevitable at this time. It's already around us. It's in our phones. It's in our you know, communications. It's, it's all over. Uh, so it's inevitable it's going to happen. But again, I think these kind of conversations are critically important to make sure that it's, it's serving us and not vice versa. Okay, thank you. Um, Stephen, um, I had two parts to my question. One was about definition. Uh, and please pick that up. But the other was, um, how is AI currently being used in the criminal justice system? Let's check out definition with you, but maybe you could move on to think about different ways AI is being used. Thank you, John. Um, I think about the definition, most uh, of the things have been uh, said already. Uh, Mike referred to the different meanings of artificial intelligence from how powerful it is, if I can say it like that. So you have, in, indeed, we are at the point still of the narrow intelligence and doing one thing at a time. Um, I think it's also very important what, what Pia mentioned is that we have to realize uh, that this is still uh, uh, created by humans. And in fact, also a little bit 
anticipating what Matthew says that it, it is is in fact our uh, very important that 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 uh, AI is 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 uh, uh, supervised by humans and also how it's built is supervised by humans. So I completely agree. This kind of uh, conversations are very important. Um, what can I say about the use of of, of uh, um, AI in criminal justice. Uh, together with PIA, uh, we have done a, a, a survey on how uh, AI currently is used in prisons uh, last year. Uh, and what we see there is, first of all, that, that uh, it's, it's still very limited its use, usage. Uh, the conclusions of that survey was mainly that people are start, only start thinking about maybe using it. Eh? Uh, there are some differences in different countries, uh, of course. Uh, uh, we have learned from some countries in Asia where they have like uh, taken a little bit more steps already to use AI, like for example in Hong Kong or in Singapore. Um, what is very important, I think, is that there, there are two main areas where AI currently is used in, in the prison sector uh, anyway, and this is uh, in, the, in the context of offender management, a little bit uh, related to what, what Pia also already referred to uh, uh, where RISE is, is working on. And the other one is, is mainly for security. Eh? So, so it's, it's direct use uh, of, of um, AI algorithms to, for example, uh, support uh, the monitoring and then the, the surveillance of, of people by using uh, uh, cameras or voice recognition systems and all those kinds of, of, of AI-driven technologies to, to to in fact um, uh, analyze and recognize things that happen uh, uh, from a security point of view. So this is what's, 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 what's happening in the main areas. Um, uh, what I'm, I'm, I think is, is, is um, more advanced and, and also something that, that, that it's very important that, that we look uh, at it uh, to also refer what Victoria is saying uh, from an ethical perspective is where AI is used um, uh, to, to support decision-making uh, and, and what are the boundaries of that. Eh? So uh, what I mean with that, in offender management, for example, we see that, and this is not all, only related to, to the start of AI, it, it, it has been going uh, uh, already for a for long, uh, long time before, uh, for example, using risk assessment uh, systems where we uh, trust on machines uh, uh, to, um, to uh, um, uh, predict, for example, if, if an offender will re-offend or not. Eh? And this is a very, very uh, difficult uh, um, uh, environment situation where, where, where AI is, is, is currently used. And, and I think it's, it's, it's something that, that, that could, I, I really would like to hear also the other, the other panel members if, if allow, about how, how do this, they, they look at, at this and then how, what are their experiences. But this is anyway something of the um, of the areas where AI is, is, is currently uh, used and, and, and a lot of uh, agencies and private companies are looking into that uh, area of using AI. Okay, let's pick up your challenge, Stephen, because certainly one of my questions uh, does relate to risk assessment. And I think that will plug into the ethics issues as well that Victoria raised earlier. So... Um, you're saying that um, artificial intelligence is being used, and maybe some algorithm links as well, to looking at the many data fields that might be necessary to assess risk. And in uh, looking at offenders either before release from prison or maybe in writing reports to assess risk, there are big ethical questions coming out of that, I would think. And I'd be particularly interested to take Vic's, Victoria's earlier challenge about what are the ethical um, risks that come. Can you use AI to predict behavior? Or do people get locked up because an algorithm says they have to stay locked up? So that's an ethical question. And again, uh, it would be great to have your reflections on that. And the other thing that I'd like to say to our audience is if you've got specific questions coming out about ethics, let's hear those. Okay, so let's move on into maybe the sensitive area of ethics and values. And who would like to pick this up first? I don't, I don't know if this helps, Thanks, but for, yeah, for me, the, the people use the term algorithm, um, and that's clearly a, a major component of AI and technology generally, but algorithms predate computers. 
So the idea of trying to predict behavior and take macro level data to help predict what's going to happen at the micro level, that's been around for, for a long time. Um, going to the point that was made, it's, we're now talking about scaling it on a scale that's been unprecedented, taking in uh, what's happened in thousands or maybe even millions of cases to try to predict what's going to happen. But even now, the tools that are currently available and someone asked, is AI being used um, to assess risk? Algorithms clearly are. Um, and if not directly AI, AI type tools are being used to predict. And what we're finding, at least in my experience, is at the macro level, it it out predicts, you know, individual people guessing, you know, not guessing or even professional assessments. But it's not as good still at the micro level, at the individual case level. So I think one big distinction that has to be made is, are we talking about AI replacing human decision making or informing it? And I've heard that phrase uh, used before um, w- when folks are going through about what AI is. Again, in my mind, this is that ethical thing that we do have to work out. At what point can, what kind of grunt work can AI do on its own and replace humans? And then what other important decisions can it maybe help inform or study after the fact, but never replace? And I think the in-out decision that you mentioned, I think is one of those decisions AI should not be making. It should be informing um, and helping give context uh, and, and studying decisions that are made, but it should not definitively be making the in-out decision. Uh, Victoria would like to come in. So uh, if you unmute Victoria, take over there. Yeah, I just, uh, thank you, Matthew. I, I, I was just um, going to sort of come come in uh, in, refer, in reference to something you said when you, when you introduced yourself, Matthew, around, you know, AI and it should be there to serve us. And I think that the the big question is, what do we mean by serve us? And if we look at the penal landscape, is it an us or is it a them? (laughs) And what I'm getting at is around issues to do with power. And, And I think we need to think carefully about, about, about that what do we mean by serving us do we mean to kind of maintain and ameliorate the kind of existing status quo of mass incarceration and 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 the, and the penal landscape or or do we mean other things is it an opportunity to actually reflect restart so, you know and there's some literature out there um one at one of uh, a book that that um I, in fact mike introduced me to many years ago was about the use of smart technologies and the ends of law and this idea that we need to actually tear up you know tear up what we've done before and actually restart <laughs> now that's a very idealistic view so I think I think what it's about, I think we need to address those wider sociological and political questions before we actually talk about the mechanics of the technology. And I think that's what will help us to get to the heart of 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 that ethical discussion. And, and Stephen and I have written uh, or at least began to propose uh, uh, you know some ethical pr- principles in reg- in relation to the digital prison. Anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet because I'm sure there's others who want to say. Yeah, uh, we've had a couple of uh, comments on the chat line, which might just be worth uh, feeding in at this point. Uh, Rogelio Pineda said, "So let me please get this correct. AI is already being used to predict that any of- offender will reoffend?" Question mark. Um, Rob Canton uh, has made a comment. We don't want to. Uh, oops. Um, In the context of a general um, observation that um, risk assessment was one of the first areas, wasn't it? That sort of the statisticians and the mathematicians came into criminal justice. You know, we started to do statistical. Um, risk predictions in the United States in the 1920s. And we had this whole era that we called um, the era of actuarial justice in the 1990s and and the turn of the century, that a preoccupation with predicting reoffending 
or predicting serious offending is something that goes back a long way in criminal justice policy, in penal policy. Um, it's been used to inform sentencing. It's been used to inform probation practice. There was a kind of inevitability that if you could improve those things using artificial intelligence, that that would be one of the first areas that was looked at. And I agree with everything Matt said about where we're at with it at the moment, but precisely because it has been such a, um, a significant area of investment in criminal justice policy, I don't think we're going to stop um, developing um, automated understandings of how to do risk assessment. I think that will continue. And there may come a point when the argument that we should just be using this to uh, support and augment human decision-making may break down. We may get to a point where someone will say, well, it isn't perfect, this automated risk assessment, but it's good enough. It's good enough because it may well get better from where we are now. It may well get better, right? And that being the case, these questions that Rob and Johan have asked are indeed very pertinent. Part of the answer to Rob's question about we don't want to predict offences, we want to reduce the chances of their taking place, half the argument about why we should predict is in order to preempt, right? So if we know that the offence is likely to take place, the next step is to then ask, them, ask ourselves as criminal justice agencies, what can we do to preempt that offence taking place? Right Now, does that mean that we surround the person with police officers or does that mean that we provide a lot more rehabilitative and support services and help somebody through a trauma? It can mean all sorts of different things. But the debate about prediction in criminal justice is at least in part, because I accept that this isn't a universal thing, is it, is it at least in part tied to a debate about preemption? And if we know something is going to happen, if there is a strong probability of something going to happen, what do we have to put in place to, to preempt it happening? And do we actually know how to do that? And have we got the resources to do it? Now, Johan's point about prediction, um, I might not answer this as well as he likes because he is quite right to say that AI is almost always associated with predictions. And that's absolutely right. Prediction is the name of the game. Whether you're running Netflix or Spotify or running Microsoft or running Facebook, predictions are what it's all about. We are moving into an age of massive predictivity, right? Everything that can be predicted using AI will be predicted according to its champions. And this is what Shoshana Zuboff says is the essence of surveillance capitalism. The whole point of this vast scale of data extraction that drives the global economy now, the reason it is done is so that businesses can predict how customers will respond and what how they have responded and what they might want next. And it's you'd be used by businesses to predict how their competitors might probably act. And inevitably, governments have got into this technology because if, if commercial organizations can predict what customers want, then perhaps governments can predict what citizens want or what criminals can do, right? Predictivity is at the heart of this. Predictivity is the name of the AI game, right? And you see it everywhere you look in criminal justice processes. It's a year since I looked, but at least two electronic monitoring companies have said they're going to move towards predictivity, right? They're no longer emphasizing um, control and compliance. They want to get into predictivity because that's what everybody in the Silicon Valley world wants to get into. So yes, there are other uses of AI, but I think before we let go of this issue of predictivity, we should hang around it a bit longer and think through the implications of that. Okay, uh, Stephen wants to come in. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for, for this, for this uh, um, uh, very interesting uh, view on it. Uh, but I, I, I 
kind of like I'm less pessimistic than you are, I think, on, 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 on how do you look at AI. First of all, I just I want to emphasize back to what Pia has said. AI is, is, is created. It's just a technology that is created by human beings. So I agree in, in a lot of things what you're saying that we have to be careful about what uh, it could become. Um, but I think it, it doesn't have to be like that and extreme like that uh, if, if we just take care and, and, we, and we create rules and, and, and we, we assure how, how we, we, we're going to use it. And, and there is a lot of work on that. I, I agree and everyone agrees on this, but I, I still believe that, that, that we have to do it and it's very important. A second point on that, I think it's also important, and then that's in fact also uh, uh, relating to, to the, the, the question from Rob in, in, in the chat and also from Ian, is can AI be used for other things than prediction? I do think it's already used for other things than prediction. Uh, so uh, it can be helpful to assist, uh, 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 for example, with observations that a normal uh, human being cannot uh, 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 do and, and, and help uh, uh, supporting that in, 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 in the prison setting, but I think also in, in a probation setting. Uh, I have seen some, some very interesting examples of, of using data to analyze a vulnerability uh, of, 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 uh, of offenders in, in, in prisons, for example, and, and, and try to warn. Maybe this is also a prediction, but, but try to uh, warn about, about uh, offenders' uh, uh, behavior that, that could, could yeah, uh, be, be, be pointing to, to suicide risk, for example. Eh? There are a lot of possibilities and things helpful. Uh, our, our Google Maps are, are, in fact, also using AI uh, algorithms to, 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 to bring us from point A to B, and, and we are trusting it uh, for some reason. Eh? Uh, so th there are also a lot of other things. And I completely agree that I think it's important that, that we focus on, 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 on analyzing what is where could we be helped with and then build the AI algorithms to support us with that instead of just focusing on on. on in general, uh, uh, how AI algorithms are indeed mainly developed by Googles and by the Facebooks and things like that to drive uh, a decision maker and co commercial uh, uh, targets. But that's uh, it doesn't have to be like that if, if we set the boundaries of that and if we and if we focus and, and and be sure to work and collaborate together that 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 that, that we that we work on that. And the last point, and then I'll, I, I give it to some uh, of the other colleagues. I think it's very important uh, not to forget. That, that the technology as such, I, the value, the potential value of technology as such is different from, from fundamental discussions we have already for decades within criminal justice is about how we do things. Eh? For example, what Rob, Rob Kenton says is about the difference between the importance of uh, uh, prediction or, or, or um, trying to, to uh, uh, reduce um, uh, predict offenses. It's, it's we have... We want to create an environment and, and support the offenders to, to, to make sure that those things doesn't, don't happen again. This is very fun, fundamental, but in fact, fundamentally, it has nothing to do with technology. So if we, if we want to build technology, we have to agree first on, on, on those things. Technology won't solve it, uh, can, make things, can make good things better and can make bad things worse. That's true, but, but we have to... Distinct, I think, for some fundamental criminal justice uh, discussions, and 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 and, and uh, we have for 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 for, for decades, and, and and suddenly say that technology is just like uh, uh, the result of that, or 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 something that that only makes things uh, better, uh, worse. Okay, we've got two or three um, points and questions come in, um, which are changing the focus a little bit. We may want to come back to that. Um, uh, interesting discussion, but I don't want to miss um, where our audience wants to take us here. Um, so here's a point from uh, Christelle Bayens uh, from Belgium, uh, and it's wanting to look at an individual uh, uh, offender perspective. Her question is, what does AI have to offer for individual offender supervision? We've tended to look at the macro. So that's, that's one question. And there, there's another uh, quite similar, if I can just scroll down to it without going too far, um, uh, is the idea that AI should not only be used on at risk or uh, individuals. At what point exactly should AI be used? For example, could it be used after three months in prisons? So this, this uh, and that from Reto Frischnecht. Now, what I'm, what I'm thinking is that uh, some people in the audience are thinking, well, okay, can it be used for individuals? 
not just at the macro sort of uh, meta level. So have people got illustrations or experience of where AI can be used in that way? John? Um, yeah, do, do you want to pick that up, Matt? Yeah, I don't know if this can help, but this there it overlaps with the conversation we had previously. Um, but the impact on the individual is is what's really significant because when does prediction become a fulfilling prophecy? So if the predictions are this person's going to be high risk for violence, we treat them like they're high risk for violence, and then they become high risk for violence, maybe because of the way we treated them. So this goes back to uh, Victoria's point. You know, these are raising fundamental human uh, questions, like how do we deal with this and prevent, allow the prediction to be useful, but not handcuffs. And an example where we've been toying with using AI type technologies to help the individual is getting at this concept of receptivity. Uh, what kind of programming will this individual be responsive to? Taking into account their personality, their language skills, their education, maybe even their hours of availability. You don't want to hook them up with, a, for example, a drug treatment program that meets when the person will be working. And then they have that, that stressor of trying to figure out, do I go to work or do I go to the treatment program? So I think that's an example where I think AI is starting to help. It can help a lot in matching the right intervention proportionally to the individual. Uh, but again, I, I going back to the bigger point, I think about us as practitioners, how are we going to manage that prediction versus reality phenomena where do we make the prediction come true simply because we're aware of the prediction? Okay. So in a way, it's a sort of a massive uh, type, type casting and forcing people into molds, and that's really dangerous. Yes. Okay. Victoria, please pick that up. Yeah, um, a, a lot of thanks to, to Mike, uh, our recent conversations, and I listened to the Reef lectures, which I've posted the link in there. I don't know if uh, international listeners can access the BBC. Forgive me if um, if it if it excludes. And and I think Stuart Russell in, um, kind of was discussing some really important points, which links to those ideas around bias and data. And, and I think for me, um, there were sort of two things that kind of came out of that for me is that machines and the logarithms don't have feelings. They don't know pain. So how can, particularly when we're working with vulnerable groups that have experienced deep pain in many, um, is, is, is that relying on, on the machine to empathize is 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 perhaps quite dangerous in my mind but for example um stuff around um and this was in relation to the workplace if i recall from from that conversation was about creating new levels or new class uh class structures um and how un unhelpful that is to society and 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 leading to oppression I, I do worry about that but also around sort of sexism and maintaining a patriarchy which is very difficult for for particularly for for women uh, but this was in the context of the workplace but I can see how that pans out within the criminal justice system as well so yes there is a danger and so it comes back to that point that I made right at the beginning, the importance to have a sound ethical framework. Um, I've talked about kindness before, that, that idea remains underdeveloped. But I think what I'm getting at is, is that can we use technology to be kind to fellow humans? And, and that's what I would like to see. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, and there's uh, some points being made online about uh, people not being represented in a system that's developing uh, AI and people being excluded from that. Um, uh, someone called Austin Treacy, uh, thank you for this point, said, could further developments of AI prediction make uh, the human decision uh, more risk averse and reduce opportunities for informed discretion? Um, does anybody want to pick that up? I see Stephen's got a hand up. Um, yeah. Okay. So Mike first, then Stephen, if that's okay. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. I mean, I think that's um, an interesting question, although I think it can be understood in a, a couple of different ways, and I might be answering it, I might not be answering it in the way that um, that Austin expects. It does seem to me that if we start using AI-informed decision-making, we might, depending on how trained and experienced we as practitioners are, decide that we ourselves had better trust this machine because our discretion may leave us, leave us vulnerable to the accusation that we didn't use the best available technology to make that parole decision, right? There might come a time when doctors get sued for not using an AI diagnostic program and relying on their own fallible judgment. There might come a time when parole boards get sued for not using an AI to make the judgment, right? If the AI is there, there will be a temptation to rely on it in some degree. And that question of degree is all important because at the moment it is easy to say, we'd better not rely on it too much. We'd better allow this to inform human decisions but we'd better leave the final decision to the human, right? But whether that calculus will remain like that, I think that is an open question, that as more and more people become used to operating within AI-informed systems, our capacity to make wise judgments, to use our discretion well, might start to atrophy. We might lose confidence in ourselves if we have machines. And, you know, to, to use a, a, Freud, a, a quote from way back, T.S. Eliot, a famous British poet, once said, we should not be in the business of devising systems so perfect that nobody has to be good. And in fact, we haven't done that yet, but we might. But we might. Let's go Stephen and then uh, Piat wants to come in. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I just was, was thinking about uh, the, the fact that we, we, we uh, have talked a, a lot about uh, prediction and risk prediction. Uh, um, I think there is, there is some fundamental problem uh, uh, often in, in, in our, again, irrelevant, uh, not related to AI as such, but the fact that we focus on risk. We can also use AI, for example, to focus on, 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 on strengths. Eh? We can uh, uh, use AI to learn about things that work. Eh? We can we can we can use AI if we use it uh, uh, clever enough to 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 give us information about things that that we just like would not be able to 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 get uh, uh, based on, on on just reading and 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 uh, data because it, it gives us a lot of possibilities to improve our decision making also for for the for the things that that we know there is a lack in current in current system there, there is a lack of of, of human beings uh, of, for some tasks to 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 be ex uh, executed uh, thoroughly to, to, to help and assist. So again, I, I see a lot of opportunities if, if we do it clever and, 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 um, and use the data in a clever way that we can, that we can uh, do things better also. That's just the point I want, want to make. This is, this is not something related again to AI. We, we, we know eh, if we compare some, some, some systems, for example, in the Nordic countries with, with, with some more uh, uh, systems uh, uh, in, in other countries where they are so focused on risk and risk needs assessments, uh, it's, it's always about risk first. If we can transfer that, we can also can do this and, and, and use technology to support that transfer. So it doesn't have to be just only focused on risk. Is I'm, I'm doing some work with, uh, with the probation service and we're looking at strengths-based interventions. Um, and your point is very powerfully made. Uh, Pia, and then I think Victoria wants to come in first. Pia? Pia, I think you're on mute. Have Do we lost you? you hear Pierre, I think, I think we're having trouble with your signal, Pierre. Um, uh, you're on mute, but can we try you again? Hello, Pierre. 
I'm really sorry, Pia, we can't actually uh, hear your contribution at the moment. Uh, Victoria, perhaps you could just um, pick that point up uh, about, it was, I think it was a strengths-based point, if you could unmute, and then we'll try and get Pia back in as soon as we've got a, a live signal. Um, I was just applauding what Stephen said, but I think I think I think um, that 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 what we're looking at is, and I think a lot of the discussion is is a is around the the, the sort of risk base. And I agree with Stephen that that um, and, and and we've 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 talked about this before about the role that that technology and perhaps artificial intelligence could play in supporting rehabilitation. I would like to go further and perhaps explore how technology can support desistance, potentially help people build communities to enable kind of recovery from trauma. So that needs to be added, I think, to the discussion as well as as, as well as this stuff around predicting. Uh, predictability but perhaps using and we see some good examples particularly in e-health and um how 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 you know if if people can populate themselves perhaps applications about themselves whether or not you know um good things can can be pushed towards humans to support them or complement um the, the the recovery journey um <clears throat> Um, and 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 so I I absolutely support Stephen in 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 that idea that w w if we focus too much on risk, but but the the task isn't isn't there particularly of our prisons and probation service to support people in recovery, and so w what can technology do to enable that as well as uh, you know the, the the risk side it's two sides of the same coin um and 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 I, I don't think we've had enough of that debate either i don't know what other people think we've got a comment uh, on the chat line here um which is a, a different point about the danger of replacing human beings by machines uh, particularly if there's a lack of staff um uh, Pia, uh, I'm just wondering whether we can hear you again. Would you? Are you able to make a comment, Pia? Looks like we've just got a still photo there, and that the line uh, has been the, the connection has been lost. Um, I'm wondering we will try perhaps get you to rejoin Zoom and make the connection again, uh, which is a, a real disappointment because I know you had something to say there. Um, Mike, you would like to come in and we'll perhaps take a different question shortly. Over to you, Mike. OK, thank you. Well, the, the last um, set of questions, the last set of issues that got talked about were really implying, were they not, that um, advancing rehabilitation is just a technical issue. And the better we are capable of doing it with systems and technologies, the more likely we are to do it. And I wouldn't be in favour of um, AI being used to support rehabilitation. And I, I'm not in, I'm I, sorry, I wouldn't be opposed to AI being used to support rehabilitation. And I wouldn't be opposed to having AI um, do prediction in the cases of serious offenders. And that wouldn't be my critique at all. But it, when you apply this to, to rehabilitation, though, the, for me, the debate becomes a little unreal because if rehabilitation, if promoting rehabilitation in a criminal justice system, promoting it in society, was just a question of doing it well, we'd be doing a lot more of it already, irrespective of whether we've got AI. The, the question of whether we do rehabilitation, the question of whether we support rehabilitation, the question whether we value rehabilitation in our criminal justice system has never been just a technical question. And it doesn't seem to me to be all that convincing to say that if we were able to do it really well in an informed way using AI, the politicians would be more likely to take it up, right? Even if you could show that that was a more cost-effective way of doing it, I don't think in certain political contexts, for example, in England and Wales at the present time, that that is likely to make a government 
keener on rehabilitation just because you can be more effective at doing it. That, that isn't how promoting rehabilitation in the criminal justice system works. It's never been just a question of technical effectiveness. And adding AI to it, which I agree we could do, and there are automated decision support networks out there, which I think in principle would help us to do that. But politically, that's an entirely debatable thing as to whether we go forward with Okay, I see we've got uh, a moving PR back, which is good. Uh, hi, Pia. Uh, we can see you. I wonder if we could, you could like to make the contribution that was stopped by the technology last time. Hi again. Would you like to come in? Oh, no. Looks like we're struggling. Uh, Stephen. Do you, do you hear you? me now? Looks like we're going to have to move over to Stephen again. Um, Do you hear yeah. me now? Oh, yes, Pia, I can hear you fine. You go with just sound. It would be great. I think we've lost that. So, Stephen, I'm afraid we're going to have to ask you to, to fill that void. Over to you, Thank Stephen. You. I, ju I just want to, want to react a little bit on what Mike was saying. Uh, I'm not saying that I disagree, but I didn't understand his... Thing that someone here uh, is seeing this and reducing the complex thing of rehabilitation to some technicalities, and and I, I, I I'm afraid that if 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 he thinks that 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 was my point, he misunderstood. I, I so at the contrary, I I, I strongly believe and and I think uh, uh, literature and all the academics ar around the world know that it's a very very complicated thing but that we are a context where you're ro uh, working in, uh, and 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 uh, we have a lot of things to do. Even further, I, I, I believe if we uh, look at AI, very sim simple that, okay, AI is trained on data and we have to get data of, uh, uh, based on how we currently do criminal justice, uh, we'd better not develop any AI systems at all and never use them because we are doing really bad. Eh? I think everyone agrees with the high recidivism everywhere in the world and, and, and the mass incarceration. So please and don't use, use AI uh, systems to, to train on that data, I would say. Eh? But what I do think is that if we uh, uh, are, are adopting that uh, technology and focus on the thing that we believe uh, as humans that we can do better, that it could have a very a valuable uh, um, a meaning, that technology, to improve the things we are doing. And maybe just one point on, on uh, something in the chat. It's, it's about uh, uh, AI uh, uh, um, changing human beings. I think we just have to look at the current situation. We are in lack of, 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 of a lot of human beings in, in, in all areas, also in criminal justice. We are looking for, for, for people. So where technology can help, like it has always helped in, in history, is doing things that we think technology can do things better than, 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 than human beings, to allow human beings doing things that, where they are better in. And I think everyone agrees that we need much more people doing, again, uh, clinical work, working with people in, 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 in criminal justice and, 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 and things like that. We are, we are lacking that in criminal justice, in psychiatry, everywhere. There is a, 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 people are, are, are running the alarm bell on that. So this is what, what human beings are good thing, and we need people for that. So if we can use technology to reduce the tasks that, that, that they are particularly not go as good in and help them, I, I, I strongly believe that there is a, a very valuable place for AI also in the uh, community. Okay. Um, interesting point on the chat line uh, where uh, a contributor just said that uh, if AI could be used on the developmental potential of offenders, that would be a really good positive. Um, I think we've struggled with, with, with Pia uh, and I think we've lost her temporarily. So I'm sorry about that. What I'd like to do is for the last half hour of our discussion is to be more future orientated. So we've had, I think, a big discussion about uh, current issues. Uh, hi, Pia, we can see you moving now. And uh, can you try sound because you've tried several times to come in? Just let's try sound and give you another voice. You're muted at the moment. Do you hear me now? Yes. Please okay, finally. Great. Okay, uh, I don't know 
what's happening. I'm really sorry for this. Please don't um, apologize. Let's go for it. It's great to have you. Yeah, just tell me if you leave, uh, lost my voice because I wanted to say something about the risk analysis and the risk management. And somebody asked about how AI can contribute to individuals. So first of all, about risk analysis, um, the whole idea is based uh, on the we don't we don't need mathematics, we need psychology. Uh, the best uh, predictor of the future behavior is your past behavior. But that is not, of course, what we want to uh, only believe in the criminal uh, in the criminal sanctions agency. So of course, we want to do something to have effect on that uh, that fact that uh, risk means that the best predictor of your future behavior is your best behavior. So, uh, for example, in my project, of course, we use the risk analysis basics when when we analyze the background factors of offenders. But the fact that the RISE AI is also a recommender system means that in this way, we will find the best practices for this particular individual to have an effect on the risk. And at the moment, we are also analyzing if we could somehow include the so-called uh, strength analysis in this RISE AI system. And I can say it's not easy, but uh, at the moment, uh, we are thinking at, that if there is a, if AI can detect absence of risk factor, that might refer that there is a strength factor. So at this point, we are this far in analyzing both risks and strengths and how to put it into AI form. And uh, this, uh, uh, when thinking about the recommendations, that is actually the individual help that if, that we are also trying to provide that everybody would find the best practice practices and solutions for their particular set of risk factors and background factors. Then I wanted to say something about the ethical side. So on the other hand, it's true that since humans program AI systems, there is a risk that we program our own bias into the system. But on the other hand, if we do it correctly, AI can actually correct also the biases that people would have in their thinking because it's based only on the on the data and the reasoning and and sometimes uh, emotions emotional factors for example affect our decision making also in a wrong way so ethics should be based on reason i think more more than uh, on the so called human fa human factors so there are both sides to consider what is ethical and and what is good to include in the analysis so there can be bias in both ways Humans are very biased, and if we program our bias into the system, then the system is biased too. But if we make the system right, it will uh, help us to be more just in our decision makings. So that is what I wanted to say all <laughs> in the same time, since I'm afraid that the connection will break again. <laughs> well, uh, we gave you a good platform, so that's good. Now, thank you very much, Pierre, for the last half hour, and we've um, not quite half an hour now, um, but for the last half hour, uh, what we'd like to do is to try to get our audience live on screen to put their questions rather than me do it for them. So we try to be, uh, be a bit more inclusive. Uh, and uh, if I could say to people sitting out there in Zoom land, uh, what we, we thought for the last section, we would be forward looking. And if the questions could be about, well, what next? Where's it going? So um, I'm going to start with a question about um, training, because that's about getting practitioners ready. OK, so that's looking to the future. So my, my question is, you think uh, things about AI and uh, information and communications technology should be more apparent in the training of probation and prison staff? In other words, should we be getting the new colleagues ready for this new world? So that's my starter question. But what I'm asking the Zoom audience is, do you have questions about where AI is headed? So that's my first question to the panel. Would anyone like to answer that? Okay, Mike first. Okay, <clears throat> I'll, I will take up your training question, but I'll take up your future question first, okay? I think that um, the most important question we can ask about the future of AI 
is who has got the power, the economic power, the political power, the cultural power to drive it forward and to set the agenda. Because if we understand that, we'll understand the context in which criminal justice systems, probation services, prison systems will be making their decisions. But there will be a context. We won't be making in criminal justice, in probation prisons, we won't be making our decisions in um, a vacuum, right? This will be, there will be significant developments going on around us in the world of surveillance capitalism, which will impinge on digital governance, digital public services, digital criminal justice, right? And as somebody said in the um, in the chat, it's not AI is not created by human beings. It's created by some human beings, as a matter of fact. It's created for some human beings that are not overrepresented in the global prison system. And the point has been made that it's powerful people who are developing, powerful corporations, powerful companies, powerful nations that are developing this. And at, at one level, that's outside our remit today. But I want to emphasize it to say that that is the, the milieu in which criminal justice agencies will be making decisions about how artificial intelligence is going to impinge on them. Now, I've asked around among my network of technological friends as to how they think technology might affect probation. And they came up with this, right? Digital risk assessment, autom digi aut sorry, automated, digi automated um, risk assessment, automated decision support systems, online rehabilitation programs, which might include virtual reality, and chatbots and voice interaction, which is, which is a kind of a, a big thing in artificial intelligence and digital at the moment. The point that was been made that was in principle, even with the technologies we have now, you could automate a vast amount of a probation services work, even with the technologies we have now. Now, the question is, would you want to? Would, would a government want to do that? Would a government prioritise that? Would a government have the resources to transition from where we are now with probation services to that? And, and all of those are kind of unknowable questions. But mm. I'm intrigued by my technological friends telling me that all of this would be feasible. We could have easily have an automated probation service. We could easily do that. Now, the thing that's of the, of the ethical things that have been said earlier on in this discussion, it seems to me two points have, have come up repeatedly, right, which, which relate to the question of, of whether we will do things. One is we can set the boundaries. I think that was a phrase that you used, Steve. We can set the boundaries, okay? We can say of this technology we want it to go this far and no further. We don't want to use it any more than, than just that, Right. Well, that's the one quick. thing. We need to be quick, Mike. Yeah, that's uh, the one thing. In, all right, I'll just make one of these points then. That's the one thing in my experience of working in criminal justice over the last 40 years that I have less confidence in now than I used to have. I don't think we're very good at constraining the political direction in which penal policies go. I just think there are drivers that in the politics of criminal justice, which were qu are quite anathema, to many of the things that I would consider progressive. And it's not that I don't think AI can do progressive things, but I don't think we have a political culture which is going to want AI to do progressive things. So that's what worries me about the future. And the workforce thing is I don't think we will necessarily feel the need to create the same type of workforce as we have done in the past in prisons or probation if we have machine augmented systems of running the organizations okay right so who would like to um pick pick that up within actually the, um, the one thing that occurred you, yeah i don't know if this helps but the one thing that occurred to me when mike was making those points that absolutely right now ai is in the hands of the big corporations and that's concern but what we've repeatedly seen is technology can democratize things for example this is going to be posted on youtube youtube is a universal communication platform that everybody is exchanging ideas and it doesn't take a lot of money to get on there. And I think things like AI, if they can simplify computer programming, which I think it, it's already in the process of doing and will do in the future, is that you may not be dependent on a big corporation anymore to come up with an idea 
uh, that's related to technology. You'll interact with the technology telling it what you want, and it will help you program it without this sophisticated background you've needed historically. So I understand Mike's concern 100%, and it goes to Pia's original point of this is just a reflection of us. This technology is a reflection of us, and if it's going to help us, it's because we want to help ourselves. And if it's going to hurt us, it will be our folly, not the technologies. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm conscious that the chat lines dried up when I asked you to ask questions that you could come onto the uh, onto the Zoom to put. Um, but if you have any questions that you'd like to um, ask the panel, uh, we've still got 20 minutes, so um, do come back online. What about training our staff, our future staff, whether it be in prisons or probation or the criminal justice system, to engage with this material, uh, information, communication, technology? Um, anyone want to pick up that challenge about training? John, I, I can tell you what, what I've been interested in of late, and I yeah, do I think that it would be sequential, and I think training will be one of those original uh, fertile areas. But even the idea of a new officer conducting an interview they may not be aware of their idiosyncrasies and how they communicate. Um, or if they assume a new case, they may not be familiar with what the client looked like previously or how they interacted previously. And I think in my mind, that's where AI can help, uh, both increasing officer self-awareness and how they're communicating and how they're coming across, uh, whether they're consistent with policy in terms of the terminology they're using and the demeanor they're reflecting. But at the same time, I think particularly new officers are going to be able to benefit from the institutional knowledge that AI could capture and theoretically transfer in a digestible way to those new officers. To me, it always seems a shame those more senior experienced officers walk out the door and so much knowledge and experience goes with them. Yeah. Pia, do you want to pick that up? Sorry, Mike. Yeah. No, no. Pia? I was about to say about the training of uh, staff. Uh, so uh, at least uh, in, in Finland, it, it's part of our policy uh, to increase the both uh, digital literacy and skills and the AI literacy of both staff and prisoners. It's, it has been part of the Smart Prison Project too. And next autumn, we will train our staff to, to use the new offender management system with this new AI component. And it's going to be a very important part to train staff to use this in a right way. So as Matt said, as a tool to make their uh, work uh, better and smoother and give them some basis for their analysis besides their own expertise, but also turn the expertise that we already have in the form of the RISE, RISE AI. And uh, in Finland, we also have a so-called national AI program at the moment. So our government has, um, uh, has a has a project called uh, Aurora AI, and uh, we are all all the all the agencies, the governmental agencies, are going to be part of an AI network. So we are we are combining all our services into a common network where people can find suitable services and get suitable uh, service recommendations from the AI network of different service providers. And I think this uh, in this project, in this Aurora AI project, it has been an important part that it's very human centered. The ethical side is a lot considered. And, and at the same time, we are using heightened la uh, latest technique uh, to create the system. So um, the system is as good as the people who develop it, who program it. So we need to uh, have the best expertise and uh, they, they have to know the ethical uh, uh, requirements that we, that we need for these systems to work. And there's a lot of ways I think AI can benefit. I think why people have this fear is actually the lack of uh, basic AI literacy. So lack of knowledge usually produces fear and these kind of terror images, what's going to happen. So we need to educate people and staff and prisoners, and we will avoid this uh, worst case scenario. So I'm positive about the future, at least in Finland and, and, and Scandinavian countries are a lot ahead of the development in, digital, in digitalization of prison systems, Finland and Norway in particular. Okay, uh, we have got a, um, a request from Austin uh, Treacy, 
Uh, could the panel comment on other AI applications in the custody sector, making them safer for vulnerable prisoners? And do they see in time AI changing the role of the prison officer? So that's very specific, again, looking ahead, also um, looking at service users there. Anybody want to pick that up? Thank you, Stephen. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can give quickly, because I, I, I'm aware of time, uh, some, some examples I've already, I, th I thought, mentioned uh, a vulnerability predictive tool uh, uh, that, that uses, in fact, data of, of, of behavior, very basic behavior, the number of, of telephone calls people have, the number of visits have, and things like that, to try to, to predict when, when, when people are getting more isolated or uh, um, yeah, having behavior that, that, that like, uh, uh, could could point to 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 some, for example, suicidal risk and, and, and things like that. So th there are there are some 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 very good examples out there. Um, I think there are also uh, uh, more and more AI, especially used in in, in uh, pattern recognition and voice analytics and things like that. Eh? So natural uh, uh, langu uh, language processing is, is is used in in a lot of pilots, uh, both in community corrections or probation as 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 in in um, in the context of prisons. Uh, and again, it's 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 all about how you shape it and what what is what is the the, the aim for what are you aiming for? Eh? So if I can just quickly say something about the future, uh, uh, reflecting on what Mike was saying, um, I, I I agree that it's difficult to change po politicians. But what I'm sure of, if all the experts and 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 the academical people uh, uh, do nothing. Uh, to work together to try to, to use technology, analyze it, and look where it can be to, uh, made for the good, uh, we will never be able to influence them. So I've seen from my experience in my career in Belgium, and, and now as a consultant, that it's possible to influence uh, those, those policymakers and to try to set those boundaries and try to, 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 to uh, uh, publish, uh, um, uh, promote uh, the good use, use of technology. Technology has has the, the, the capacity of, of making things worse, but also making good things better. Eh? So it, it's both things and it's the humans that have to decide how, how to drive this. And I think it's, it's, it's similar for, for AI. And just one small point on the, on, the, uh, on the educational aspect, it's fundamentally, it's extremely important to involve the human beings who are using that technology and, and, uh, because it, the change can be huge. Eh? Um, and also at that point, uh, we, we can see that, that sometimes we, we over, over, uh, exaggerate or overthink the cap capabilities that that people have to adopt to to adapt to, to technology. So so again, it's it's it, it's very important to focus on technology uh, and and, and uh, training uh, uh, staff uh, and people who use the technology. It's very very important to do that. So so yeah, it's it's uh, that's what's my final point of uh, of uh, education. Okay, now um, I'm going to go around the panel. Um, because I'm, we're not that far from the uh, end time. What I'd like to ask you to do is to see if you've got any um, advice to people in the field um, or any final points that you'd like to make to our listeners uh, as we head towards wrap up. Uh, Matt, I'm wondering if you'd like to kick off and I'll go around everybody in turn. Is there any closing points you'd like to make to the audience? So Matt, what, what would you like to say is, yeah, I think basically that AI is an extremely powerful tool. And if good people with good intentions don't use it um, or they deny themselves the tool, bad people with bad intentions will use it. So it's, again, it's a tool. It's only a means to an end. It's not an end onto itself. But I think, again, I, I applaud you for having this kind of discussion. And I think there has to be a lot more discussions, as everybody's saying, and developing principles and priorities uh, but again, I think the, the genie's out of the bottle. AI is coming. And I think uh, Pia mentioned AI literacy. That is critical at this point about what it's capable of and what it's not. But it goes back to Victoria's point. These are all human decisions that we have to resolve. And only we can do that at this stage. Um, I was almost thinking numerously when, when Pia couldn't get on in the future, if AI doesn't want to hear Pia's opinion, will it literally knock her out? Um, but right now, fortunately, I don't think it's there. Uh, so I think these conversations are really important. So I appreciate you having it. Right. In the interest of making sure we can get Pia while she's there live and <laughs> blinking on our screens. Pia, the floor is yours. Um, what advice would you want to give to practitioners or what are your final comments? 
Yeah, I, I liked what uh, Stephen uh, said that we have to believe that uh, we can have influence on things. So uh, practitioners, researchers, experts, we shouldn't stay passive in this process. So we, we have to get interested in this. Sometimes people in humanities have this kind of, uh, uh, they are a little bit aversive towards uh, technology and and this is this is a very bad thing because if we want the so-called good ai we must combine humanities the knowledge we have in humanities to technology and that's what i've been interested a lot since uh, my basic education is a psychologist but at the moment i'm working with digital projects and i think that has been my strength that i come from a totally different background than most of the team that I'm working with. And I think it's very important that I'm, as a psychologist, um, part, of, part of the team. So I, I believe we can have influence and we should be brave in experimenting and testing. And yes, also involving, as we will do with Rice AI, that we will also involve offenders in the process. So we will uh, try to share the results the, the proof of concept and the test use results with uh, real offenders to see if the recommendations match with their idea of what the recommendations for them should be. So we can, we can develop it to t together. I'm, I'm sure about that. And I also want to say that what I said about the fears of technology, so it's both the lack of knowledge, but also um, people usually fear things that they think they cannot control. And since technology is uh, developing so fast, I think it's a very understandable reaction that we feel that we are not anymore in control what AI, uh, for example, can become. So that's why it's really important that we have AI literacy. That's why it's really important that we participate in the process, that we believe that we can have influence, that we don't uh, stay passive. And, and we involve uh, in the development of technology, we involve people with different backgrounds, like backgrounds from more social and psychological background, like myself. Thank you. That was um, beautifully put. Thank you very much indeed. And the sound was fantastic the whole way through, Pia. So that was really good. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, uh, would you like to have the floor next? Okay. Um, well, in terms of thinking about the future, I would like, because I accept that this technology is coming in some shape or form, I accept that it is coming. So I think that the the unions and the professional associations in particular in the criminal justice systems that I'm familiar with, um, who may not have realised that this technology is not too far away from them, I think it is very important that they get on top of the debates about AI and work out if they can what they think will be beneficial and what they think will be threatening and debate that. So, I, I think that the, the professional criminal justice debate about, about artificial intelligence can be a bit myopic sometimes and unwilling to see or even imagine that there is a bigger context to what's going on in their professional world outside of them. And I think when you, when you look at, when you interrogate the people who are looking at the bigger picture about AI, they are worried about um, a cybersecurity nightmare because my answer to, to Matt's point is both the good guys and the bad guys will use AI. It's not a question of the good guys using it so the bad guys don't. Both guys, both sets of guys are going to use AI. And I think that's going to create a milieu in which we have a cybersecurity nightmare. We already have the rudiments of a cybersecurity nightmare now. People may not have realised that, but it's only going to be exacerbated by um, artificial intelligence. So there's a big picture which the immediate professionals who are concerned about this in criminal justice need to get to grips with. And I think that the, this concept of AR literacy is indeed a very useful one, but the there, there are more, there's more than one narrative about artificial intelligence, and I think it's important to try and understand all of them. 
Um, I don't, th I mean, the irony of me being alarmed about this technology is because 20 years ago, when I got interested and excited about the prospects of electronic monitoring, the boot was on the other foot. I was the one who has been told that I was um, over enthusiastic about this technology. But in some ways, I've learned. I don't think we have used electronic monitoring in criminal justice in the UK, in the United States, as well as we could have done. In fact, I'm quite alarmed about some of the things that we've done with it. I'm always less alarmed about what goes on in Scandinavia. The Scandinavians, the Finns, the Norwegians, the Swedes, you're good guys and you tend to use all these technologies well, but I don't think you're typical. And that's why I worry about it more than you do, Pierre. Right, uh, Mike, uh, uh, warning flags there, but thank, thanks very much indeed. Uh, good wisdom. Uh, Stephen, um, over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, John. Um, I, I think I, 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 we all in line on on, on the need to to uh, to think about it, to analyze more deeply, and 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 to be very very careful with with, with how technology can use. Uh, there are some some different opinions here about how and the impact and what will happen in the future. Uh, uh, I'm mainly uh, my my thing is that what, what based on my experience uh, working in the field of technology and started my career as a probation officer. Uh, 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 what I have seen is that 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 problematic was the lack of engagement, the lack of involvement in uh, technology-related projects from from the business, from academics, from politicians. It was like technology is something like for the nerds in the corner over there, and because of that, technology has been shaped in many 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 projects by by private companies who just make money out of it. What I have seen in all the project, the digital transformation project I've worked in. Where it makes a difference is when people start to care. They involve, they, 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 they engage. And this is what we have to do in criminal justice. I don't know that we will, we will uh, uh, win it uh, the, 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 towards the, the bad guys, uh, that the good guys will win it towards the, the bad guys, things like that. I even don't want to go in that, that direction of, of polarizing things. But what I do, the, the only thing that we can, we can make sure that if we use AI, that it's, it's going to be used for the good is that we all engage and the, uh, we all be critical and and also and then I, I, I especially agree also what Victoria and Pia has, has been saying that that we are uh, believing and, and trusting us as human beings and 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 and, and uh, that that we can change it and that we can say that the humans are creating this technology. So that's my my message. It's engaging and and I'm not meaning that we have to use AI. But engaging meanings, but we have to have this conversation and analyze where it can be good for uh, used for the good. Thank you, Stephen and Victoria. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. I, I I absolutely agree with that, and I also recognise Mike's position. And I think that the the debate isn't as polarised as we think it is. And for me. I think I've seen some very powerful shifts in um, decision making with respect to kind of co-production, engaging all stakeholders, including the public, including families of those involved in the criminal justice system. You know, what are the needs and can together can we design solutions that might not involve technology or artificial intelligence to actually meet the needs of 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 humans uh, and this is what we're talking about here and so you know the power of co-producing solutions may negate this kind of tidal wave or the fear of the tidal wave that machines will take over the world um, and that they will be thinking for us and making the decisions on behalf of us. Um, I, I, I think that, that we have a, a sort of moral oblig obligation to ensure that 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 all solutions are, are meeting human needs and that and that these these are, are are framed in 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 i suppose for the public good um uh for 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 um 
a, a, a shift towards not just exacerbating the punitive landscape and feeding these corporate machines. It's about meeting the needs, right? And we want our criminal justice system to work. And I agree with Mike's point earlier about, you know, that, 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 that there's this, this kind of myth we need to de demystify some some kind of narratives around technology that it will make things better. There are there can be unintended consequences that we've seen elsewhere in society where technologies come. So I, I'm very kind of pro meeting needs and and the the the, the, the kind of decisions around around developing you know um, new policies, new practice should come from kind of collaboration that's really where i want to finish <laughs> thank you well that sounds like a good place to conclude and it's almost time to sign off um i've got a friend who said he saw some research from america matt of all places where um they got ai to assess some legal documents and they got the ai system to assess these legal documents in 22 seconds better that it would take a lawyer maybe an hour to do. So uh, I think what I'm saying is that from a different part of the, the justice system, uh, AI is coming and it's going to shake us all up one way or another. And if it's shaking up American lawyers, you can, you can bet it's going to shake us up too. Well, I think the time's come to draw the discussion to a close. Uh, and I want to give you the news that INCJ has an action research hub looking at uh, information and communications technology and its influence on practice after the pandemic. So I want you to keep an eye open for details of a webinar on this topic, which is going to take place uh, in late April 2022. So if you're interested to hook into this for further discussion, well, follow us on Twitter, which, as I've said earlier, is at INTCJ Network, or visit the website, which is www criminaljusticenetwork.net. So, with a really big thank you to our panel members and to you for watching and listening, can I say goodbye? Stay safe, keep well, goodbye, and see you next time. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network. <laughs>